I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to Luke chapter 14. The Gospel of Luke chapter 14 is our text. And if you are worshiping with us at our Sweetwater campus and, uh, and you don't have a Bible and you want to follow along, then grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1038. If you're joining us from our Parker campus and you don't have a Bible, then right now just get up where you're sitting and there's a table in the back of the room and you can go grab a Bible and turn to page 1038. And if you're joining us from home and you don't have a Bible, well, we can't give you one right now, but if you let us know, we'll get you a Bible. So you can follow along as well uh, because we want you to be able to follow along. And if you're at any of our campuses and you don't have a Bible and you want one, just take one of those with you. We want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, I don't know about you guys. I really like that last song. I like all the songs, but I really like that last song. And that was a preview because uh, Monday night at 6.30, Right here at the Sweetwater campus, we're going to be having our Celebrate Recovery 18th anniversary celebration. For 18 years, Celebrate Recovery has been changing lives. God's been working through them, and this is our 18th year celebration. And to celebrate, we're offering all of you to come and have a concert. Jill Miller, who's the lady who was leading that last song, is a recording artist from Nashville. She's going to be leading a concert, worship concert. So uh, that's at 6.30. But if you're hungry, dinner's at 5.15, and it's free because this is a party, and we're inviting you to it. So do you guys want to come to a party? Okay, well, then you're invited. So uh, come and worship and celebrate. I know a lot of you are harassing us always about, can we have a worship concert? Yes, Monday night, 6.30, in this room. There you go. Hey, uh, also, let me just, since, since we're talking about celebrations, this is kind of a, you know, uh, a season of celebration uh, because, you know, football season is starting this weekend, right? Anybody excited about football season? Yeah, I see a few jerseys out there. Some of y'all need to do better. But you know what else it is? It's life group season. Anybody excited about life group season? There we go. I like that. You guys are louder for life group than football. Praise God. So, and, and if you're not in a life group, it's not too late. You can sign up. Just stop by one of the tables and check them out. Although a lot of the groups are filling up, and I praise God for that. Hey, uh, one more thing I just want to mention. I'm going to ask you to pray for me because in 10 days or so, I'm leaving for uh, Malawi and Mozambique in Africa. Uh, I'm going to be spending a couple of weeks there teaching uh, national leaders, and I get to go and visit uh, some, the part of Mozambique where we've been putting wells in. By the way, the last count that I got, Calvary has sponsored 86 freshwater wells. Yeah. Isn't that cool? You, I mean, you guys have just done an amazing thing, but here's, here's the thing that blows my mind. That means over 64,000 people a day are drinking clean water because of your generosity. Yeah. It, uh, you see, I, I get excited about that. And uh, part of that report that they got, gave me was that uh, this year alone, so 2022, they've seen about 280 decisions for Christ out of the well ministry. So it's making a difference physically and it's making a difference spiritually in the lives of people in Southwest Africa, in Mozambique. And I just praise God for that. So I get to go and hang out there for a little bit. So please be praying for me because the travel is um, not fun. Hey, since we've been talking about all these celebrations and stuff, uh, how many of you have ever thrown a party? A anyone? Okay. How many of you have ever thrown a party and nobody came? Oh, look, some hands go up. I'm not the only one. That's really cool. You know, that is such a terrible feeling if you throw a party and nobody comes, right? I mean, because you feel unwanted, you feel unloved, you feel undervalued, you prepare, you clean the house. You know, some of you, that's like the, the excuse. All right, let's have a party so I can clean the house. Uh, you know, clean the house, you decorate, you cook, you get ready, you stress out, and then no one comes. Or worse, one person shows up. Because then it's just like a whole evening of awkward, Right? I don't know where everybody is, uh, but uh, anyway. So anyway, just for the record, I, I threw a party that no one came to professionally. So I was a student pastor in Georgia, and uh, the pastor had this idea, hey, let's have a, a marriage and family conference weekend. And he put me in charge of planning it, and so I did all the, the plans. I enlisted the speakers, arranged the child care, put together the program, uh, took care of all that stuff. But here was the problem. Nobody of any... Uh, influence promoted it, i.e. the senior pastor didn't promote it. And so we were planning for like 100 to 200 people to be there and about 20 to 30 showed up. 
It was a disaster. It was awful. It was terrible. Uh, and if you've got a story, uh, share it with your life group this week <laughs> or, uh, or over a meal, uh, you know, today or tomorrow. But today we're looking at a parable about a party where no one came. Luke chapter 14, beginning at verse 12. And Jesus also said to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But Jesus said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant said, so the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry, and he said to his servants, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Now, Jesus is at a dinner. And he's the guest of honor. He's the one of importance. It's with a bunch of religious, righteous, important people. Uh, and he's been there. There's actually chapter 14 is uh, mostly uh, the conversation over dinner that Jesus has with these people. But he reminds them while he's at the dinner to include and invite the marginalized, the overlooked, the outcast. He says, hey, don't, don't just invite the people who can invite you back. Look for the people who can't pay you back and include them as well. Now, uh, why does he do that? Because most of us are friendly to our friends. I mean, we are. We're, we're friendly to our friends. And, and that's part of the problem. Most of us are friendly to our family as well. I said most of us, not all of us. Here's the catch. And this is what Jesus says. Even people who don't acknowledge God do this. That, that's not a, a character trait of people who follow Jesus. It, you know, look, even people who are godless are friendly to their friends and their family. But if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that Jesus actually died on the cross for your sins, and you believe he was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then the expectations of how you do life are different. In Jesus' kingdom, we are friendly to everyone, but we're especially friendly to the outcasts and the marginalized and the friendless. That's a mark of Jesus' church. Now, like, I, I, I'm going to confess, I love seeing the joy expressed when friends meet in our services. You guys know I love to come out and hang out with you and, and shake hands and greet people. And I love seeing, you know, you guys greet each other and, and friends connecting and life groups sitting together and hanging out. I love that. Um, but I also wonder, do we ever look around and see the people who are left out? See the people who are sitting by themselves, see the people who are lonely or heartbroken uh, and hurting. Would you ever dare to introduce yourself to someone you didn't already know and maybe invite them to come and sit with you or to join your friend group for dinner or lunch after services? I mean, would you take that risk? You see, my reality, I want to know everyone. Guys, if you, if you don't know me, then just know. I want to know all of you. I want to know your stories. I want to know your life. I want to know your families. I want to know your friends. I just want, you know, I want to know all that stuff. I want to know how God changed your life. Uh, but it's impossible. Truth is, I can't do it. 
doesn't stop me from trying. I still schedule time every week to take people who are new to Calvary to lunch because I want to hear your story. And then I hear so many of them, I can't remember whose goes with which person. <laughs> but, but it's not just true for me. It's true for all the pastors. And, and if you're new to Calvary, then please, by all means, call the church office and say, hey, I want to have lunch with one of the pastors. And they'll set it up, set a time, because we want to hear your story and we want to help you connect to the ministries of Calvary. I mean, that's kind of what we do. And uh, now, I say that, don't be a calendar hog and schedule lunch with me and with Joe and with Chet and with Robert and with Jesse and with Reuben, you know, and just go on down the list. You know, pick one of us. Uh, but, uh, but two thoughts if you've been at Calvary for a while, okay? And, and I, let me just say this. How many of you have been at Calvary longer than six months? Okay, that's most of you in this room. If you're new, we love you, the fact that you're here. This doesn't apply to you. But here's, it, you can do it, but this doesn't necessarily apply to you. So if you've been here for a while, two challenges. Number one, how about inviting someone that you don't know to join your, you and your friends for a meal? Okay, just, just look around and go, let right, them invite that person. Let's invite them. Just, just try it, okay? That, that's a challenge. And the second one is much easier. Just stop parking and guest parking. Okay, if you raised your hand and you said you've been coming for a while, um, you don't qualify anymore. Okay, uh, just, just a thought, okay? Now, here's the thing. If we truly want to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, we have to value the outcasts. Have to. And, and then Jesus goes from that, that broad statement about care about the blind and the lame and the forgotten people, and then comes the warning. It's a warning. And this parable is a warning parable to the people who are having dinner with him. I already told you that Jesus was not a good dinner guest because uh, he's at a dinner party surrounded by religious leaders who are watching him and he's already irritated them because he healed a man on the Sabbath right as he got to the dinner party. Okay, so he, he broke their laws and so they're already mad at him. And then he tells a parable right before this one where he confronts their pride. Okay, if you want to hear about those two things, those are the last two sermons. Joe preached the first one. I preached the last one. And, and so he, he, then one of the leaders, do you hear this, verse 15, kind of toasted their place in the kingdom. He said, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now, that, that man made that toast basically with the people around there going, hey, guys, we're all going to eat bread in the kingdom of God. And then Jesus told the parable of the, you know, uh, of the wedding feast. And he, so he's challenging them and he's warning them to listen to the parable so that they have an understanding of what he's talking about. And, and the first thing he did is say, hey, don't assume your place at the table. Don't assume your place at the table. Now, they were all assuming their place at the table because they were God's chosen people. They were physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, King David. They were in that line. They were the, the ones that God had picked out of history and brought his Messiah through. And, and so they assumed the special relationship would last forever no matter what. And Jesus challenged that assumption and warned them, don't treat God's invitation casually. Don't treat God's invitation casually. Now, this, this parable doesn't necessarily make sense because they said he was preparing a feast. And it, look, if you're throwing a dinner party, what do you do? You just call your friends up, text them and say, hey, Saturday night after church, 6.30, we're going to meet here. We're going to go to this place. Or, you know, we're going to come over on Friday night. You know, maybe you're going to have a party tomorrow with the Cardinals game. Hey, come over and, and we're going to do it. So you just text them and tell them when to show up because you have appliances. And you can cook things. You can go to the store and get meat and things like that. But in the first century, when they were doing a feast, you know, they had to prepare things. So they basically sent out their servants as a save the date kind of message. Hey, there's going to be a feast soon. Be ready for it. So they gave kind of a heads up. And then when all the preparations were made and, and all the food had been cooked and all the things were prepared, then they sent their servants out to tell them, hey, now's the time. And so you're supposed to drop what you're doing and come to the feast. That's how it worked. That was culturally understood. So he's not asking them to interrupt their schedules. He's asking them to do what they always do. And what do they do? They, they came, the messengers went out, and they were ignored. All these people that were invited to the feast were unresponsive to the invitation. And they gave lame excuses. Did you catch that? 
Oh, I'm sorry, I can't come. I bought a piece of property. Like, it's going to go someplace? Can't make it. I have to go look at dirt. That was what he said. How about the next guy? Hey, I bought five yoke of oxen. I got to go test drive the oxen. What, are they going to look any different than every other oxen does from the backside? I mean, is that, are you really worried about that? You bought five yoke of oxen. Someone else is going to be plowing behind them anyway. Um, and, and then I love the last guy. He blames his wife. Did you catch that? I mean, the excuse is I can't come. It's my wife's fault. I married a wife. <laughs> Guys, we've got to improve our excuses. I could ask right now, how many of you are still using that? Some of you are brave enough to raise your hands. The other's are like, honey, can I raise my hand? <laughs> See, I just want you to know you guys are biblical in the wrong ways. So, so the man threw a party and no one came. Now, notice some things about this. First of all, the party is not dependent on the guests. God's party is going to happen anyway, with or without you. He's throwing the party. The host responded. He said, okay, fine. You go out and get the poor and the blind and the lame. Get the outcast. Bring them in. Go get them all. All the people that other people don't want, I want. Go get them. Um, <laughs> just, and I love how he said, because those guys that turned me down are getting none of the food. You're not going to get any of it. Um, for the record, I don't know if you guys realize this, but we are the ones in the story referred to as the poor, blind, and lame, and outcasts. Did, did you know that? In this story, this story is a warning to the religious leaders of Israel that they are missing out on the party, and because they're missing out on the party, we get to go. We get to be included. See, God's chosen nation ignored his invitation. The religious leaders of Israel rejected the Son of God while he's sitting there at table with them. They didn't believe. Now, understand, many Jews believed in Jesus in that first century. I mean, look, at the beginning of the church, Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon every person who believed, 3,000 people became followers of Jesus, and every one of them was Jewish. Okay, 3,000. For the first, you know, 80, 90 years of Christianity, everybody else thought it was a Jewish cult. I mean, that's what the Roman authorities called it, a Jewish cult, because there were so many Jews involved. And, and, and then, uh, you know, all the apostles were Jewish. All of, you know, all the, the New Testament was written by Jewish followers of Jesus. So the majority of first century Christians were of Jewish origins. But the religious elite, the people who were designated as being God's representatives for the nation to him, made the excuses. They protected their interests and they rejected the invitation. So the master sent his servants to gather the outcasts. That's us. That's us. Aren't you glad you got invited to the party? <laughs> this section right here is. Are you guys glad you got invited to the party? I mean, I, look, I just I'm re read the parable. I would not be ambivalent about the invitation. That's all, that's all I'm going to say. So, you know, Jesus warns them and says, don't assume your place at the table and don't treat God's invitation casually. That was the message for the people of his day. But what about us? What's the application for us? Let's talk about the application. How does this parable impact our lives? I mean, I already told you, we're the outcasts, we're the blind, the lame, all that kind of stuff. But we need to hear it, and, and we need to understand the truth that Jesus wants us to hear and how it intersects with our lives. So the first thing I would say is don't presume your relationship with Jesus. Just don't presume that you have a relationship with Jesus. We preach, we teach, we talk nonstop about leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay? That's what we want people to have, a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And still, as much as we talk about life change, I have conversations with people that go something like this. Well, I hope I make it to heaven. No, you don't have to hope. You can know. You know, you surrender to Jesus. Or people say, well, you know, I, I, uh, my parents were pastors. My grandparents were missionaries. And, and, or they say something generic like, well, I believe. Okay, you believe. That's great. That doesn't mean anything because following Jesus is not a generalization. It's not a label. And it's not connected in any way, shape, or form to church membership. 
Following Jesus is a life-altering commitment we make when we realize that we are hopeless without Christ and we surrender completely to him. So please don't presume, please don't assume, please don't be casual about your relationship with Jesus. If you're not sure that Jesus Christ has changed your life, let's talk. Okay, we want to talk. We want to, we want to encourage you. We want to make sure that you're going to the party. Now you can do that a lot of different ways. You can find one of the pastors after the service. We're going to be out at the connection centers. We'd love to talk with you. Just come up to us and say, hey, I want to talk about this. I'm not sure. We'll, we'll leave all the rest of the people shaking hands and stuff, and we'll just pull aside and we'll talk. Our prayer team is going to be here at the front at the end of the service. They would love to pray with you, talk with you. If you're not sure, they can help you be sure. You don't want to do that tonight because you, you got made a party you know, plans afterwards? Then grab one of those Connect cards right now and put your information on it and say, I need to talk about my relationship with Jesus on there. We will contact you. You're the priority. We want you to be sure. We don't want you to be casual about it and go, well, I think I'm going to make it. Now, I share all that, and if, but if you're one of those Christians that has prayed 350 times for Jesus to save you, can I just tell you to stop worrying and enjoy the party because you're already there? Seriously. You just need to go ahead and get comfortable with grace. Uh, you're, you don't deserve it, but you're already there. So don't presume your relationship with Jesus. And please know, this is good news, you are invited to God's party. You are invited to God's party. I already mentioned this, but I, I can't help but mention it again. God wants you at his celebration. That is amazing truth, isn't it? That God actually wants you at his party. Not, not in a generic sense, like, oh, I just want all the schlubs. Just bring them all. I don't care. No, he wants you. He wants, he, literally, he's like, I, I, want, I want you, and I want you, and I want you, and I want you guys to come, and I want you to be a part of my kingdom, and, and I want you to experience grace. And look, it, this is a, a, just such great news, especially if you've ever been one of those who's been marginalized or outcast. Anyone here ever felt excluded? Yeah. Doesn't feel good, does it? Somebody hurt you? You know what, you know what the antidote to that is? To realize that the King of Kings and Lord of Lords invited you to his party, and he wants you there. It's like, well, I don't care if you ignored me. He wants me. Look, that'll set you free right there. You stop worrying about whether anybody else accepts you, and you know that God Almighty thinks you're wonderful, and he wants you at his celebration. So God wants you at his celebration. Do you want to go? <laughs> Again, you guys, yeah, yeah, I'll go. <laughs> I don't have anything better to do. Yeah, maybe, sure. Uh, okay, so here's the thing. You want to go. Have you said yes to the invitation? See, that's that commitment that to Jesus. If you're, again, if you're not sure, let's talk about it or do it right now. Just go, okay, Jesus, I want to go. I'm, I'm yours. Now, here's the, here's the tough part. You may not want to answer this so enthusiastically. Are you committed enough to stop making excuses? See, we're so good at making excuses of why we can't follow Jesus at this point, of why we can't make it at this time, of why everything else gets in the way of us being the people that God's created us to be, that God's empowered us to be, that we want to be, but we haven't committed to being. So let's stop making excuses and go to the party. Be a part of God's celebration of his kingdom. Uh, because if you want to be there, then welcome to the kingdom of God. Romans 10, 13 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And, and by the way, this is cause for contagious celebration. It's one of our core values here at Calvary. We believe following Jesus results in a joy-filled life which draws people to Jesus. We just actually believe that when you understand the good news and you let it inside your life, that it tells your face that something good's happened and you treat people with a smile and with joy. And as you're living your life with, in, with joy in this messed up crazy world, people go, that's attractive. I think I want to be a part of that. Now, if you're living your life as a curmudgeon and you're grouchy all the time and you're grumbly, just don't tell them where you go to church. <laughs> all right? Just being honest, don't, probably don't even tell them you're a Christian, okay? Just don't do it because that's like, ooh, I don't want that. See, this is cause for contagious celebration because we are no longer outcasts. We are the family of God and we've been invited to God's party. So that's great news, but I also need you to know this. If you want to attend the party, 
It's on the master's terms. Now, this man threw the party. He determined the guest list. When those guests said no, he expanded the guest list and he excluded the rude ones. Now, Jesus, Luke doesn't include this part of the, the story, but in Matthew, Matthew 22, which is uh, on page 983, if you want to turn over there, uh, Jesus tells the similar parable, and he kind of ends it a little bit different. So I just want to read the ending of the same parable, Matthew 22. It says, but when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him in the outer darkness. In that place there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Uh, and a lot of people read that and they go, hey, that doesn't sound very kind. That doesn't sound very nice. Why did, uh, why did he treat that man that way? That seems harsh. But remember, the, the, the master, the king, the, the man throwing the feast, he got to determine who the guests are. He got to determine what the menu is. And he got to atten- uh, determine the attire. And so if you went to a wedding feast, you were given wedding clothes. Okay, so it, you didn't have to buy them like you do now if you're like, you know, going to be a maid of honor or something, you know, that kind of stuff. You have to buy all that stuff or rent a tux. But you were given wedding clothes to wear and everybody at the, at the wedding party, you know, they had the wedding clothes on. That's how you knew you could get, go and, you know, get the wine or hang out and get the cake or whatever. So uh, this man's not wearing wedding clothes. And, and when the king comes down and says, why aren't you wearing wedding clothes? He doesn't have an answer. Now, if he's at the wedding feast, he was given wedding clothes. He chose not to put them on. He chose to do it his way instead of the way that the master said. In other words, it's his party. You attend on his terms. By the way, if you want to get to God's party, which is what heaven is, then you have to do it God's way. And God's way is Jesus. We sang about it just a little while ago. God's way is Jesus. Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The apostles in Acts chapter 4 said, For salvation is in no one else. There is no other name given among men under heaven by which we must be saved. Look, I could go on talking about the exclusive claims of Jesus on uh, salvation. But if you want to get to the party, then you got to love Jesus, surrender to Jesus, follow Jesus. There's no other way to get there. And a lot of people don't like this. Can I just... Let's just be honest. A lot of people are not comfortable with this exclusive claim. They go, well, can't we just broaden it a little bit? You know, because I got, you know, look, a lot of people in the world think that that we're being mean because we say Jesus is the only way. I don't, I don't really mind what people in the world think, but surveys say about half of people who call themselves followers of Jesus think that there's more than one way to get to heaven. And I'm like, who are you listening to? And, and I get it because you got neighbors and they're nice people and they're good people and they help you out and, and you're like, I like them, but they don't believe and I want them to be able to make it. And then you should, and, you know, tell them about Jesus. You should invite them to come to church. You should, you know, pray for them. Because Jesus is the only way. And, uh, and, and, and here's the thing. Reality is exactly the same. I'm wearing a Cardinals jersey because I'm a fan. I'm not going to the game tomorrow because I'm working. Uh, But but I have gone to Cardinals games. And if you go to an NFL football game in any city, they have these ridiculous rules about what you can carry into the stadium. Okay? So you can't take a backpack. You can't take a fanny pack. You can't take a purse. Now, you can take a clear bag that looks like a purse of certain sizes only, and, it, and then it can't have certain things in it. And you got to follow those rules if you want to get into the game. Doesn't matter if you have a ticket or not. You still have to follow the rules or you don't get to go into the football game. Now, that's inconvenient. Let me tell you about one that's really crazy. The Masters Golf Tournament, Augusta, Georgia. I've been five times to the Masters because I married well. Uh, and uh, 
wife's family's had tickets for generations. So, uh, so I've been and and at, at Augusta, it's kind of the, if you don't know golf, it, the Masters is sort of like the Super Bowl of golf, okay. And, and, and when you go there, you, you enter into this place that is like no other place in America that I've ever been. But the, the members of Augusta National make the rules. And so if you get a ticket, you still have to follow their rules to get in. And you know what? In this day and age, you cannot bring a cell phone or a camera on their grounds during the tournament. 50,000 sane adults <laughs> don't bring their cell phones into the Augusta National grounds. I mean, can you even imagine that? I mean, you're talking about no cell phone for eight hours during the day. Can we even do that? <laughs> yes, we can, if you want to be in there. Here's the thing, they, and they've got better security than our airports do for you getting in that, in that uh, golf grounds. But here's the thing, if you smuggle one in, you are good enough to smuggle a cell phone in there, and they catch you with that, you know what they will do? They will throw you out, and they will put you on a list, and you can never enter their grounds again. You go, well, that's not right, but it's their golf course and it's their tournament and they don't care what you think. If you want to go, you got to go on their terms and people are begging to go on their terms. Why are we okay with that for a golf course? Why are we okay with that for a football stadium? Honestly, why are we okay with that for Disneyland? But we're not okay with it for God Almighty? You see, the only way to get into the kingdom of God is to have a life-changing relationship with Jesus. There are no exceptions. That's why the master's servants are so committed to bringing people to his party. So, again, do you know you're going to the party? Okay, then, then if you know you're going to a party, then you're a servant of the master. And if you're a servant, then we've been sent to bring in the poor and the blind, and the lame, and pretty much anyone and everyone. So who are you leading to a life-changing relationship with Jesus? I mean, don't you want your family and your friends at the party? I know I do. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Your invitation to life and to joy and to eternal life is so amazing. And God, we, we just repent right now because sometimes we take that so casually. We treat it like it's no big deal. And it's the greatest news that has, has happened to us. And Lord, I pray that, that every person here who knows you and calls you Lord uh, would just be filled with joy at the reality that heaven is their destiny. And Lord, I also pray that you would fill them with just a sense of urgency for their friends and their family that don't know you and, and aren't really concerned right now. And Father, for those in, that are in this room or joining us online or, or at our other campus, Lord, if there's somebody there who isn't, who hasn't called on your name yet, I pray that today would be the day that today they would decide, I need to commit my life to Jesus. I need to surrender to him. And I need to begin a new journey with him. This is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.